Well, I suppose this is me reaping what I sow. Almost a decade ago, I released my first big video about the Legend of Korra, which I never suspected would get particularly big. I just made it because the style I was aping seemed like it would be fun, and I'm embarrassed about it now. And it largely avoided the controversy of its beefier little sister, because Legend of Korra never had the same psychotic, cultish, violent, and evil fan base that the other one did. Anyway, over the last few weeks, that video suddenly saw a surge in viewership, and I was inundated with requests to talk about the live-action Avatar. And then I was confused, because that movie is over a decade old. Why is that relevant? What do you mean Netflix made a live-action series? What in the unholy fuck? So a live action remake of Avatar released recently on Netflix, and to the surprise of absolutely nobody with any kind of pattern recognition, it turned out to not be great. An adaptation that filters all of the characters and themes through the lens of peak TV, which is to say soap operas for men and horny Twitter ghouls, and would proceed to do to Avatar what Baldur's Gate 3 did to Baldur's Gate. It was so bad that Bryke left the show over creative differences and decided to open a studio to make more adult-oriented animated series in the franchise, because that went so well the last time. Now, not to sound smug, but I call this as a bad decision the moment they announced a lot live-action series in the first place. First of all, we already know Avatar doesn't work in live-action. The live-action film already proved that, but the fandom huffed the copium by blaming M. Night Shyamalan, and not the fact that this was just a bad idea that was fucked over by the studio. The idea of remaking something in live-action is always strange. You already have the show in the first place, why the fuck do you need it again? I'm often asked if I'd like an animated series of Kingdom Hearts, given how much I love that series, and it's always been a strange question because that just sounds like Kingdom Hearts without the gameplay, and the fact that Kingdom Hearts is the best action game on the market today is like half of its appeal, and I would probably enjoy it a lot less if I didn't get to beat people's heads in after their big stupid anime monologue. There's also the fact that without Square Enix's money and the basic framework of how video games work, the action would just be worse. I've held that attitude to everything, honestly. A live-action remake of Avatar just sounds like Avatar again, but less expressive and less goofy. This is especially the case in dealing with a Netflix series. An announcement came out about them wanting it to be more like Game of Thrones, which says all you need to say about the priorities. The people involved wanted to milk a brand that is somehow still popular, and then make the peak TV version of it, because you can't just make a normal series, it has to be just like everything else. If after that you were still thinking, this could still be good, then you were clearly an Avatar fanboy just desperate for more Avatar, and you're the problem. See, Bryke had been trying to slowly and painfully euthanize its franchise for years. Pretty much since the moment the series ended, the writing was on the wall. First there was that god-awful run of comic books that has the main characters trying to decolonize the Earth Kingdom, but when the colonists refuse to leave and start throwing a tantrum, they just go, okay, guess we'll just make new Tel Aviv then. And now the Earth Kingdom has this settler state hanging off of it like a malignant tumor. Then they made the live action movie. Then they made a sequel series where the main premise was let's watch this grown woman get treated like an invalid by the men around her and then torture her for kicks and then make her get healed by the person who tortured her, all the while we'll continue protecting an unjust status quo. Coming into Korra, Bryke were like, we're gonna get political, and everyone was like, do you know anything about politics, Bryke? And Bryke was like, mm, maybe. Then there was that run of video games all trying to be these weird RPG puzzle things before someone had the sense to go, hang on, this is a series about elemental martial arts, isn't it? And then made a fucking spectacle fighter like a sensible human being. 52 dick punches! Then we had another string of comic books where, after taking down the devil and a Death Star on legs, Korra goes back to getting her shit wrecked by some glorified bandits, like if Goku fought the IDF and lost. Then they announced not only a new live-action series, but a sequel animated movie. And somehow, someway, people got hyped! despite how in every documented case before it, the result was a fiasco. I'm genuinely concerned about the Avatar fanbase sometimes. I think so far the fanbase has been able to keep huffing the copium and blaming things other than the writers. The movie being bad wasn't because a live-action remake is a bad idea. It was all that meme director's fault. They did everything. Ignore all the information coming out that it wasn't actually their fault. I don't care if Ong is actually the proper way to pronounce it. My nostalgia! Korra wasn't bad on a fundamental level. They just didn't have the time or the budget because those things would automatically make it better. They only thought they were getting the one season. Are you implying if they knew in advance they were getting four seasons, the Equalist plot would have been even longer? Yes! That's worse. The Equalist plot was bad. On a political level, they took a bad stance. Making it longer wouldn't- I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm not gonna slit your throat. I promise. The shit of Avatar vastly outweighs the good, which consists only of the original series and the Korra video game. Everything else has been bland at best and offensively bad at worst, and the fandom just 
keeps coping, keeps deluding themselves into believing that the next one will be the good one. The next one will be good. It has to be good. Avatar wasn't just good. It was the single greatest cartoon ever exist. It doesn't matter that literally everything the creators and lead writers ever made after that was absolute piss, Will. Avatar was good. Avatar can still be good. Honey, it's time to let it go. Because even if something around Avatar comes out and is great, it won't ever be able to match the sheer level of expectations and emotional investment people have pumped into the franchise. Avatar isn't a cartoon at this point, it's a fucking religion. Trying to match up to Avatar, trying to recreate it, trying to do what Avatar did, has been the fundamental driving force of every terrible cartoon released in the last 15 years. Nothing could live up to Avatar. Even Avatar can't live up to Avatar. The original series is a very good adventure comedy that occasionally delves into hard-hitting emotional subjects like genocide and imperialism and actually handles them with some degree of tact. But its reputation is of this amazing, vague moment where animated shows peaked. And if we just have enough lore and enough loud, epic music, we might recreate that. Avatar fans are like Potterheads. The emotional investment in the franchise does not connect at all with its actual quality. Because Avatar isn't remembered for what it was, it's remembered for what it represented, and all of the things that make it work have been slowly scrubbed away from it. Everything about the series from the ground up was the joys of friendship and diversity. The Avatar's journey is find people to teach you, which also means touch grass and make friends. What do we get in the sequel series? Occupy Wall Street and Korra needs to calm down and do what the men tell her to do. Oh hey, an actually interesting philosophical dilemma, and it's gone. A libertarian that flies in torture porn. And lastly, oh fuck, it's been half the season and our villain hasn't done anything evil except smirk. Time to get in the fucking death robot! There's no time for character development, we're serialized now, bitches! We sacrificed everything so people will feel like the show is more prestigious. I've never seen a sequel series miss the point so badly. Korra feels like the version of Avatar that people seem to remember. Big. Everything is big. Big villains. Big scope. Big bending. Keep getting bigger. Big lasers. Big robots. Big. It's the kind of show made for people who say the best episode is Sozin's Comet. But not the whole thing, just the big climactic fight scenes where the music gets super epic. Well, I've stalled long enough. Let's get right into the remake and see what's been left to fester under this rock. So the show opens with a man being chased through the streets by Fire Nation soldiers and getting into a bending fight with them, before handing off a scroll to his partner, with intel saying that the Fire Nation is going to start a war. So it seems like we're just before Fire Lord Sozin's invasion of the Earth Kingdom. However, Sozin reveals that the intel was planted specifically by him, and it's a diversion to take eyes away from the Air Nomad so he can kill the next Avatar. It was I who allowed the Alliance to know the location of the shield generator. Then we get the classic intro in 3D animation for some reason. This intro is way more in-depth as to the lore of the Avatar cycle and Sozin's genocide of the airbenders, something that was used as a dramatic revelation in the series, but here is just an exposition dump. Tells you a lot about where this series is going. Hope you're ready to fill in some wikis, kids! Then we see Aang giving Gyatso an aneurysm and foreshadowing the fact that Gyatso's about to die. I quite like this moment, actually. It's a nice, heartfelt scene that does the kind of good character work you'd expect from Avatar. Turns out all the air nomads from all the other temples are here for a comet festival, in spite of the fact that they they all know the Fire Nation is marching for war. Goodness! This seems like a foolish example of tempting fate, now doesn't it? Gyatso attends a council of elders and argues that Aang is too young to know that he's the Avatar, while the others argue that with Sozin's plan to attack the Earth Kingdom, they need the Avatar at their backs. However, Aang isn't a fully realized Avatar and doesn't have the powers of one, making him not in any way close to the trump card of the previous Avatar. Gyatso makes the argument that training him as the Avatar before he's of age will cause serious damage to his personal development and weaken him as an Avatar overall, because he'll be training for war and combat instead of traveling to mature and grow as a person. A subtle criticism of the legend of Korra. Why, you cheeky little bitch. Gyatso, under duress, brings Aang to the statue of Yang Chen and tells him that he's the Avatar. I'm gonna be the needless contrarian I am and say that this scene is done better than the original. In the original, Aang's pressure to be the Avatar is under vague remarks about storm clouds brewing and he balks under the pressure. Here, it's just Gyatso and he's very specific about what's coming on the horizon. This means that Aang is under even more pressure, making his flight seem less about immaturity and more about a panic response. In the animated version, Gyatso doesn't really take this seriously, intent on preserving Aang's innocence. Here, Gyatso does take things seriously, but because he's doing that, you really get a feel for how much he doesn't want to be doing this. He wants Aang to still get to be a kid. He shouldn't be asked to stop a war, but his back is against the wall. You get to feel how both of them just absolutely hate this situation. You know what? Take a W, 2024 Avatar. This bit here is really good. Can't I just keep pretending I'm your friend? You are my friend. You will always be my friend.
Aang goes and talks to Appa, expressing fear over the idea that his status as the Avatar will alienate him from others. Given how communal the airbenders are, that's an understandable fear. Then he and Appa take off and run, just as the Fire Nation has arrived to Order 66 the entire temple. The monks, as is to be expected, put up an extremely good fight, but with the power of the comet, the firebenders ultimately have the edge and they start dropping like flies. Meanwhile, Aang gets caught in a storm, drops into the water, goes into the Avatar state, and water bends himself into ice. Cut to a hundred years later, we see Katara practicing her water bending while Sokka's trying to train the children to be guardsmen. Then the two of them head off to find some food for the tribe. While there, Sokka remarks to Katara how dangerous it would be if the Fire Nation caught her water bending, as she's the last water bender of the tribe. Now, in the animated series, the genocide of the Southern Water Tribe is implied to be the reason Sokka's ignorant to water bending, allowing Katara to naturally exposit about what bending is. But if we're being honest, it's been 20 fucking years since then, and nobody needs it explained to them. So this time, Sokka expresses deep concern about his sister as putting herself in danger. The two actually get into an argument about the fact that Sokka wants to be prepared to ward off the Fire Nation's genocide, but Katara feels waterbending needs to be preserved because it built their culture, arguing that it doesn't matter if you survive if you lose your culture in the process. Cultural genocide is still genocide. I won't mark this down as an L or a W, it's kind of equivalent exchange. It reflects on how Sokka, despite being a dope, feels a sense of responsibility as the older sibling. I kind of like it. I like it when siblings care about each other in stories. I don't care for the way fighting and bickering is normalized. However, it is still mostly just more lore, whereas the original had character, because the character is the important part. The two lose control of the boat in a current, and Katara finds the iceberg that Aang was trapped in. Katara attempts to bend the boat back to the ice, and in doing so, awakens Aang. In the original, Katara awakens Aang because Sokka is such a chauvinistic prick that he ends up driving her up the wall, and she cracks it while lecturing him. This is where the show can take an L, because Katara freeing the Avatar through the power of sick of this sexist bullshit was just objectively funny. The fall of the Fire Nation was set into motion by Sokka being an annoying little shit. They bring Aang back to the village, and nobody knows who he is or what his deal is. This is interesting, actually. The airbenders have been gone for so long that only the oldest person there recognizes one on sight alone. A chilling and subtle effect of genocide in that it was so complete, most people aren't even aware it's happened. Aang wakes up and starts demonstrating that he's an airbender to the amazement of the others. My sky bison? Six legs, horns, brown arrows, sky bison. Sky bison! Repeating it doesn't help. Aang explains who he is and where he's from, and Katara's grandmother recites the intro from the show. Say the line, Bart! Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Yay! And then explains the Air Nomad genocide to Aang. In the original, Aang discovers this himself when he goes back to the temple and finds the skeletons of the monks, including Gyatso. Aang actually gets so angry with grief and vengeance that he goes into the Avatar state. He doesn't actually do it again until the second season when Appa is stolen and- Tell me where are they? Just imagine the sheer, unrelenting, shit-your-pants fear at being confronted by an angry avatar in full avatar state when you've wronged them severely and can't fix it. Bro, I just lie down and say, kill me now. Here, Aang flees from the room and sits on top of the hut, brooding. Katara comes out and explains how she lost her own mother, again, something that is drip-fed in the different episodes of the original until the Southern Raiders. The entire sequence here is extremely stilted and awkward as they try to shove as much exposition in as possible, and honestly, it just lacks the emotion of similar moments in the original, or even the prologue of this show. So yeah, take an L, Avatar. They head back into the cave where Katara was practicing, and Aang gives Katara a basic lesson on energy that allows her to show real progress with waterbending for the first time. Unfortunately, the moment's ruined by the imminent Fire Nation raid. Their grandmother correctly guesses that Aang must be the Avatar, and that's why they're here. She does that a lot, actually. She kicks the plot forward like a soda can on the sidewalk. The Fire Nation arrives, and Zuko demands that they hand over the Avatar, or they'll burn the village to the ground. And Sokka... Uh, wants to do it. What the fuck, man? In the original, he charged Zuko with no fear. Sure, he got his ass kicked, but he was ready to throw hands the moment Zuko got off the ship. What is with the live-action versions of this show making Sokka such a bitch? I think this is a format problem. Every adaptation and continuation of Avatar has tried to go for po-faced and serious drama, and a character like Sokka, who is multifaceted but otherwise largely comedy-focused, is considered to be riffraff to the serious peak TV vibes we're going for. This show in particular has aspirations to be like Game of Thrones, and we all know what it means to be like Game of Thrones. Lots of misogyny and sex and random character deaths and the other thing. Katara and Sokka argue, and Sokka caves very quickly, good decision, and he heads out to confront Zuko himself, and the two actually duel, and Sokka gets his balls rocked until Aang intervenes and saves him from being killed, and fights the firebenders himself. But Zuko orders the village burned, and that's when Aang surrenders to save them. This is actually another character change caused by fandom. Zuko threatens to burn the village 
twice. In the original, Zuko is one of the four protagonists established in the first episode, and his story arc is about being a victim of abuse. But he is often, erroneously, called a villain redemption, in spite of the fact that he does very little harm throughout the show. So because the popular fandom view of him is villain redemption, the adaptations make him more evil at the start. In the film, he demands all the elderly rounded up and holds them hostage until they give up the Avatar. In the show, he grabs Katara's grandmother just to demonstrate how old he thinks the Avatar would be. He'd be about this age, master of all elements? <gasps> In the live-action show and the film, he threatens to burn down the village if Aang doesn't surrender. But in the show, he doesn't. While him and Aang are fighting, Aang becomes aware of the fact that someone could easily get hurt if he fights like an airbender and starts evading. So he just asks Zuko to promise to leave the village alone if he surrenders. And Zuko... agrees. Not once does he ever threaten the village. Sure, the village is under implicit threat because others have raided the village before, but we're getting an immediate look into the fact that Zuko isn't like the rest of the Fire Nation, something that is reinforced in damn near every episode after this. This changes Aang's surrender. Aang surrendered on his own on the basis of a promise, to which Zuko agreed and kept. It's a show of Aang's selflessness and how he thinks of bystanders first, but it's also a show of Zuko's honor, which is later shown to be his defining virtue. In every adaptation, this moment that shows Aang's selflessness and Zuko's honor is turned into a threat, an intimidation tactic, stripping away the virtues of both characters to establish Zuko as a villain. You know, everyone gets mad about how Sokka is treated in live-action adaptations, but nobody is ever angry at Zuko being repeatedly made more malicious and more evil, because it's just common wisdom that Zuko was a villain who got redeemed. So the logic is, well, we gotta make him a villain at the start. But I'd argue this is worse than Sokka. In terms of character assassination, they literally have a victim of abuse who previously was characterized as very reasonable, honorable, and sympathetic, turn to his subordinates and yell, BURN IT! Out of the two things you should be angry about, you should be more angry about that. But people aren't because they still think Zuko is a villain redemption. This is straight up character assassination. Zuko didn't threaten innocent people. Take a fucking L, Avatar. After the Fire Nation leaves with him, Sokka and Katara set out to rescue him, where you think Sokka might stop caring because so far the show has characterized him as something of an isolationist dick. Aang is taken prisoner aboard Zuko's ship, where he talks to Iroh about why the war started, and Iroh counters that it's been so long most people don't know, and make guesses and remarks on the importance of how it ends. Iroh is... different than he is in the original, but unlike Sokka or Zuko, that difference isn't a downgrade. I think the most apt comparison is Richard Harris Dumbledore versus Michael Gambon Dumbledore, where Harris was a kindly old old grandfather while Gambon was an imposing and powerful wizard, or Gandalf the Grey versus Gandalf the White. Iroh in the original is something of a silly old man at the start, doing his silly old man things. But that silliness is hiding both great pain and great wisdom, often able to say outright traitorous words to someone's face and not be called on it, because he said it in a silly proverb. He keeps how powerful and wise he is close to his chest, letting people think he's a foolish and senile old man. Just because you see a smile, don't think you know what's going on underneath. I think in in this case, because we all know Iroh's deal, he's more openly displaying that wisdom, pain, and hesitation at the start, as opposed to at the end. Original Iroh surprised the audience as much as Zuko, but there isn't really a surprise to be had anymore, so they just play him straight. I'm okay with this, as it's keeping in spirit with the original while doing it differently. Aang steals the key, breaks out of his cell to sneak out of the ship, but he's spotted by Zuko at the last second, who panics and demands they open fire. His glider's burned, but Katara and Sokka catch him on Appa at the last second. As they're fleeing, Zuko shoots at them again, but Katara saves them with waterbending. Good job, Katara. Realizing they can't go home because the Fire Nation would come for them, they instead head to the Air Temple ruins, and Aang sees for the first time what's become of his home. Charred, broken, falling apart, and filled with bodies. It's here he finds the bones of Gyatso. He's so enraged by this, he ends up going into the Avatar state, throwing around both rubber and his new friends. However, memories of Gyatso's last words to him ultimately calm him down, and he falls to his knees, where Katara consoles him, and he cries. Now, um, I'm gonna be a contrarian again. I think the live-action show does this a lot better. In the original, there's a very awkward sharing of the trauma and a big speech about family, but here, well, we already went through that, so things can just remain unsaid. Furthermore, Aang is actually allowed to cry. He doesn't in the original, and the scope of grief is covered a lot better. Not just the fact that he's the last of his people, but he's lost the closest thing to a parent he's had. It goes hand in hand with the much better established bond between Aang and Gyatso, so yeah, you know what, take another W. The scene afterward is a lot worse, however. The emotion's gone, everyone talks like they're reading the first take of an audiobook, and they quickly run through the plot, and the Zuko glares very angrily at a drawing. The thing about losing everything 
is that that's when you learn how strong you really are. It's when you learn to fight. I'm not going to get on their case for that, honestly. The actors are kids, and I still remember how vicious everyone was to Jake Lloyd for what was honestly pretty good acting compared to this. But I feel like the director could have said something to the effect of, talk a little slower and with more purpose. You're not reading your book report, guys. The second episode opens with Zuko having a mantrum because he misplaced some notebook while Iroh stands by watching, like that guard in The Force Awakens. Zuko is enraged that the Avatar ran and calls him a coward. In the original, because Aang went into the Avatar state to trap their ship, Zuko gains a level of respect for him and vows not to underestimate him again. Good news for the Fire Lord. The Fire Nation's greatest threat is just a little kid. That kid, uncle, just did this. I won't underestimate him again. But in keeping with the theme of nobody actually got how this character works, he's just a pompous, arrogant dick. Meanwhile, the gang resolves to head to Kiyoshi Island to find a connection to one of his past lives. But before he leaves, he buries Gyatso. I'll be nice and not comment on the acting in this scene. I'll also be nice and not comment on the next scene with Zhao and Iroh and just say... My earlier Force Awakens comparison was pretty spot on. There's something off about Zuko's performance and acting and delivery and characterization and the way he stares ahead with his mouth agape that just reminds me of Adam Driver. He's got that freshly beaten across the back of the head with a bat energy. Most importantly, you need to have sticky rice. Uncle! There's no time for this. Okay, I take it back. That was good. The gang arrives on Kiyoshi Island and is immediately subdued by the Kiyoshi warriors. They don't believe he's the Avatar because there would have been a sign. And I guess Kiyoshi was something of a little diva because she chooses at that moment to go, I lived, bitches. Kiyoshi Isle turns out to be an isolationist micronation that doesn't want to get involved in the war. But Aang gives a heartfelt speech about how he appreciates how the leaders of the island want to keep their home safe from war and how he'd very much like to bring back a sense of his own home. It's a very good moment. Actually, some pretty good acting. Gordon Cormier is kind of up and down with his acting in this this series, and rather than hang on the moments where it's bad, I'm gonna highlight the moments where it's good instead. They decide to allow Aang to stay for a short time, and Sokka and Suki bond over shared responsibility of guardianship over their people. Now, Sokka doesn't have the same unlearning chauvinism character arc he had before, because, well, as we're gonna get into, the writers don't really think highly of women in general. So here the position is Sokka, who had been thrust into a role of responsibility very suddenly, having to get the kind of guidance he never had before from someone who has more experience with that role. And he's still stumbling over himself and saying the wrong things. So Sokka's still learning something from Suki and getting a humbling dressing down for her, and that's the important part. Conversely, fucking hell, what did they do to Katara? So far throughout the show, Katara has had the personality of blank printer paper. In the original, Katara is impetuous, risk-taking, and energetic. She evolves from a character who is quick to anger to someone who can control and direct that anger. A lot of people have come to believe that Katara is this motherly character, but, uh, no. Katara was like Sokka, ready to throw hands at a moment's notice. From now on, you're on your own! Apologizing to a sour old man like you! I'll be outside if you're man enough to fight me. See? The key to bending is. Will you please shut your air hole? Katara, why don't you worry about gathering the firewood? Because that kindling's looking pretty sorry. Well, if you don't like my firewood. Ah! Sugar Queen? Did you just slam the door in my face? How can you be so infuriating? Open it to me! So let me tell you something right now. You make one step backward, give me one reason to think you might hurt Aang, I'll make sure your destiny ends right then and there. Permanently. Like in the film, Katara's energy in the remake is just sapped out of the room, presumably due to the fandom understanding of Katara as this gentle motherly matron, and not an unhinged princess of the sea ready to drench a guy at a moment's notice. Funnily enough, because they had the same voice actress, a lot of people kept making comparisons between Amity Blight and Katara, and honestly, Amity had more genuine Katara energy than any of the other Kataras do. I don't know who gave Gawain Dio 700 Benadryls before filming, but they need to stop doing that. I'm kidding, actually, it's not her fault. The writing for Katara has been pretty bad for a while. I have the sneaking suspicion that given it's been 20 years since the original first aired that the writers of this show were fans of the original, and that's why everyone's characterization is just really off. Because fans of Avatar have always been pretty shit at character analysis. 
Sokka tries to charm Suki with a boomerang, only for Suki to show him up, and then the two of them spar, but Zuki immediately trounces him before he's even finished stretching. Then Sokka watches a training session of the Kyoshi Warriors and tries to mimic what they're doing, when Suki dismisses them and trains him privately. So far throughout the episode, Sokka has been trying to impress Suki by positioning himself as already as skilled as her, but it's only when he humbles himself that he makes any progress in bettering not just himself, but the burgeoning connection to them. Their romance is a little awkward, but to say that the romance in the original was awkward is like saying the IDF has a slight ethics problem. Problem. Sokka's episode in the first season generally only shows Sokka getting humbled, and it isn't until the second season that they re get reunited with Suki. It's the casual air of their relationship from that point onward that makes it one of the best in the series, showing that Bright is best at writing romance when they don't. So it's not even an L or a W, it's just the same. It turns out that Zhao is set off in search of the Avatar as well, and led both his men and Zuko to Kyoshi Island, leading to a standoff between the Fire Nation and the Kyoshi Warriors. While all this is going down, and a big issue I'm having is the fact that scenes change so rapidly, and can communes with Avatar Kyoshi. In the original, he mostly communes with Roku, suggesting that Avatars largely seek guidance from the previous Avatar in the cycle. Here, Kyoshi is actually a polar opposite of Aang. Aang is terrified of hurting someone with his powers, of losing control, but Kyoshi says that, in no uncertain terms, that Aang's cowardice and desire to run and flee and avoid his responsibilities have already gotten many people hurt for the last hundred years. It's a longer version of the conversation she has with him at the end of the original, when Aang is trying to find a vegan option to end the war, that in in action is itself an action, and Aang's constant refusal of his duties has done the very thing he's afraid of, gotten people hurt. To get his ass in gear, Kyoshi gives Aang a vision about an assault on the Northern Water Tribe, using the threat of a second genocide to spur him into action, like, you're at war, bitch, you don't have the choice to do nothing. To make a point to him, she manifests into the real world to save Katara, and then give a beat down to the Fire Nation. And I'm almost positive this was done entirely because Kyoshi has achieved girl boss meme status, and so getting to see her kick ass was pure fan service and nothing else. And you know what? Take a W, that was fucking awesome. Take two Ws. Before we continue on to the next episode, I want to establish a critical spectrum for the rest of this video. In critiquing anything to do with Avatar, it's common to hear the refrain of, you just wanted the original again. But I'm not averse to changes to the original, so long as they understand the spirit of why the original worked. Removing Sokka's chauvinism isn't a problem because you should know what that arc represented. Sokka being a boisterous asshole, filling shoes far too big for him, and getting pig-headed as a result. His arc is about humility and learning from others, and to not try and act like he has everything together. As long as you still have that, it doesn't matter if Sokka is sexist or a show-off or a Dunning-Kruger fool, as long as his arc is about his humility. This is often referred to in fandom circles as understanding the assignment. This is why Zuko doesn't work in any live-action adaptation, because the common sentiment is of him as a villain who got redeemed, and so adaptations make him more villainous than he was before. In reality, Zuko's arc is about trying to regain his honor, while simultaneously demonstrating that he is the only only one in the Fire Nation military with any honor. Zuko doesn't threaten people, he doesn't hurt people unless necessary, and even when faced with lethal intent, he doesn't respond in kind. Zuko is not a villain, and he has never been a villain, and he's only made a villain in adaptations because the fandom erroneously believed him to have ever been one, and have used him as a comparison point for other villain redemptions. So you didn't understand the assignment, and therefore it's bad. This is the key fundamental reason why Korra failed spectacularly, because everything from the the characterization to the structure to the plot fundamentally missed the point completely, to the point Korra as an avatar was actively set up to fail at every opportunity. So it doesn't matter if you don't have the specifics down, so long as you get the point. And this show has so far bounded back and forth on that like a metronome in a vacuum. Some things it does better e than even the original by building on ideas, like someone on the writing team had years to really think about a good idea, and the production team let them cook. In others, they mimic the aesthetic and the motions but fail to grapple with the point, and this is the metric I'm judging the show on. The reason Avatar was good was because it was a show about the power of friendship, blown up into a ton of mini lessons about humility, learning from each other, diversity, anti-imperialism, building bridges and connections with people, and how the world is a beautiful place if you step outside your walled garden. It's a show where the villains and the people who are villain adjacent are the ones who close themselves off and refuse to allow others in. Where the belief that you are fundamentally better than others, or destined to lead, aren't just false, they are foolish ideas that will get you killed. It's a show 
about what it means to touch grass. Avatar wasn't good because the lore was in-depth or they accurately represented the countries they lifted from. They didn't. They actively merged entirely different cultures together into these weird hodgepodges like Blizzard with the squirts. It wasn't good because it had a serialized story with continuity. It wasn't good because it had a villain redemption. It was good because it had very strong, well-written characters and used those characters to reinforce a series of very good, very important, but also deceptively simple themes. It was a lot of children's first introduction to the idea that stories could have themes at all. The next episode opens with a group of rebels trying to enact their own July 20th plot. Oh, look it up. I don't have time for this. But oh no, it was a trap. Ozai waxes poetic about being the greatest nation in the world, and I gotta say, I've always taken a liking to villains that are willing to humor their adversaries. Like, I could have you killed right here, but let's talk first. It doesn't make Ozai any less of a megalomaniac, but it does let the actor flex for a bit, and that's always a 100% positive result. My compliments on making it this far. Cheeky bastard is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Turns out the person who got them in was Azula, making this whole ploy one big game of 3D chess on Ozai's part. I like that. Ozai in the original was this ominous presence for the first few seasons, but by the third, he was just a big take-over-the-world dick. He wasn't even really a true believer in Sozin's imperialism. He just wanted to rule the world because ruling the world would be cool. Here, he's a lot smarter and more active in the story. Make no mistake, I love cackling cartoon supervillains. I mean, I'm not insane. But it's like what I said with Gandalf or Dumbledore. I like them both in different ways. Aang and Katara are at a river practicing bending, with Aang providing the basic lessons on energy and chi and chakras and shit. The monks always said I never listened. I think that's what they said. I never listened. Hey! <laughs> They fly off to the north, but en route they spot what looks like a glider heading to the city of Omashu, with Zuko, Iroh, and Zhao hot on their trail. Once again, Zuko shows how the writers really didn't understand the assignment when one of his soldiers gives him information on Zhao and Zuko reprimands him, showing him to be a stickler for authority. While Zuko was a patriot in the original, he showed a great deal of camaraderie with his fellow soldiers, more so than other officers at any rate. Here, the roles are flipped around. I don't care for that, and I'd mark it an L if Zuko's characterization wasn't already on the list. The gang makes it to Omashu, only to find it really dislikes outsiders. Oh hey, a settlement doesn't like outsiders. They haven't done that multiple times now. They ask someone for help and disguise themselves as Earth Kingdom citizens to get inside, and I think that's Jet. Aang sees what he thinks it might be an airbender and takes off after him, but it turns out the airbender is just a boy in a wheelchair with a fancy machine. Then the market explodes. I didn't skip over anything there. They find the guy and then boom. You're not an airbender. An airbender. Of course I'm not. Turns out the Fire Nation has spies in the city who have been conducting terrorist attacks, but since they have an airbender, they feel maybe they can take the fight to them, using Aang's airbending to throw bombs right back at them. None of this sits well with Aang, who has an attitude about violence somewhere between a Jedi and Steven Universe, but he's taken the lesson from Kiyoshi to heart and agrees to do something about the bombings. Then we cut back to Azula, who is seething over the fact that Zuko got credit for finding the Avatar. Turns out Azula has this weird inferiority complex about Zuko and is bitter at him supposedly getting to come back and be in their father's good graces again. This is a far cry from the original, where Azula's personality was somewhere between Valen and a Roomba with a knife taped to it, a violent, unhinged sociopath who spent her childhood being increasingly excited by violence and was determined to strive for perfection in the field of spurty murder. She knew that Zuko was being banished with an impossible task over his head. She knew he was flat out disowned. Here, she's still the golden child of Ozai, but has for some reason deluded herself into thinking she's actually some kind of put-upon scapegoat. I mean, that's not Zuko's sister. That's more like my sister. Don't like that. Take an L, Avatar. Back in Omashu, Katara finds the mechanist giving information to the Fire Nation spies. She and the boy from earlier tail after him, and I was right, it was Jet. They chase him out into the forest, where Jet takes on three firebenders with two swords. In general, it's always visibly spectacular when a non-bender fights benders and doesn't get immediately trounced. And it turns out he also has reinforcements, who jump out of the trees and go prison rules on the firebenders. Jet takes Katara back to their base, where his rebel alliance lives, and tells Katara his sad backstory about losing his family to firebenders. Katara retells a story about how her mother was killed, and it's done a lot better here than it was in the first episode, and shows some very good acting from Gao and Dio as she quietly revisits a painful memory, and then immediately tries to shake it off before trying to remember all the good things about her mother. Jet encourages her to hold on to the good memories as they'll serve to inspire and motivate her, and it actually has a positive effect on her bending. Gold star! I adore this scene. We don't have to be afraid of our pain. We just need to decide what we're gonna do with it.
While they're murdering the firebender, Sokka and the Mechanist are bonding over a shared love of engineering, something that was also a fixture in the same episode in the original, but is hung on a little more as we explore a bit of the leadership pressure Sokka's under back home. I like that. Zuko and Iroh infiltrate the city, and upon learning that the Fire Nation agents have been conducting terror attacks, Zuko is immediately disgusted at such an underhanded way of waging war, fighting in the shadows like a coward. It almost feels, at times, like they understood the idea that Zuko has honor, but then took their definition of honor from, like, Klingons and Orcs and Mandalorians, where Zuko's honor wasn't in fighting a good fight, it was in keeping his word, fighting where others couldn't fight for themselves, being gracious in victory, humble in defeat, and looking out for his men. Here, he says that Ozai wouldn't approve of an underhanded tactic, but the entire reason Zuko was here was for calling out his father indirectly for using cowardly tactics that threatened their own people, calling out a general for betraying the rank-and-file soldiers. I just told my daddy's full of it. I watched his face turn red. Zuko was a leader. He wasn't a fucking Klingon. I'd say take an L, but I already gave you an L for yada yada yada. Meanwhile, Aang and Tio are exploring a salt mine, looking for the source of where the firebenders are getting their explosive equipment, only for Aang to discover that it wasn't firebenders at all. Aang rushes it back to Sokka with proof that Jet was the one responsible for the bombings, right as Katara comes back to tell them it was the Mechanist. I wonder which one is the real traitor. Spoiler alert, I watched the original, and it was both of them, because they were in separate episodes. Sokka calls her out for being taken in by the smoldering of a greasy bad boy, and... Well, Katara's 14, that's not an unfair assumption. Katara runs into Jet, who all but admits they intend to kill the Mechanist and his son while also taking out the King and any innocent people in the way. And it's time to engage in Avatar's favorite trope, Freedom Fighters Boiling Kittens in Lava. <laughs> Katara runs back and tells Aang and Sokka that they planted a bomb on Sai, but they're stopped by Zuko and Iroh. Aang tells Katara and Sokka to go and he'll fight Zuko on his own, and remarkably, Zuko lets them. And the two fight hand-to-hand -hand without any bending. Zuko uses martial styles from the Fire Nation, while Aang uses the ancient tradition of Thomas and Gerald. At least until Zuko gets beat with a broom by an old woman for fighting a literal BB. Then Aang lets slip that he has Zuko's notebook, and Zuko loses his composure and firebends. Say the line, Bark! <laughs> Yay! Katara and Sokka catch up with the Mechanist, and Katara manages to extinguish the detonating arrow at the last possible second. Gold Star, Katara! Firebending causes a panic, forcing Zuko and Iroh to flee, or rather Zuko to flee, while Iroh sacrifices himself so Zuko can get out in time, while the soldiers capture Aang while he's trying to extinguish the blaze, and the episode ends. It's a cliffhanger. Aang is brought to a prison along with Iroh, and the two of them have a talk. This is twice now, actually, and I'm quite liking the increased interaction between Iroh and the other characters. Didn't happen all that much, but given that Iroh is quite an interesting character, getting to watch him speak to people other than the Fire Nation earlier on is fun, even if it's short. Back at the Mechanist's house, he confesses to having been working with the Firebenders. Sokka and Tio are understandably furious. The Mechanist tries to appeal to the protecting my family argument, but Sokka doesn't accept it for a minute. Then Katara breaks in and tells them Aang's been arrested. They go over what they can do to break him out, and it turns out there are secret tunnels underneath the mountain. In prison, Iroh and Aang discuss pessimism versus optimism before Iroh is carted off to a work camp while Aang is brought before the king. The king offers him tea and reveals him to be the Avatar. Aang recognizes him as Boomy immediately. There was an entire episode about Aang having to figure it out, but if it's not clear, this two-parter is meshing five different episodes together. All in all, that's fine. It gives more opportunities for Boomy to be funny, and indeed, Boomy is very funny. Throw him! A feast. <laughs> While they're getting ready to rescue Aang, Katara is confronted by Jet for stopping their assassination of the king, and Katara says, You're fighting for the wrong reasons. Finally, Avatar has matured and become grown up and is saying profound, complicated things like, Until now you have become the very thing you swore to destroy. Jet gets angry at that, and Katara tells him to take a chill pill. Stay cool, bad boy. Yeah, take an L, Avatar. You did this with Jet before, and like half the characters in Korra, but the fact that you're still doing it 20 years, multiple wars, and two genocides later is fucking gross. Just stop. Just stop doing it. Meanwhile, Zuko is broken in looking for his uncle, only to be put in a position to choose between saving Iroh or capturing Aang. Then it cuts back to Boomy. This was something the original did a lot, putting Zuko in an ethical dilemma and then cutting away, only to cut back later to show, yeah, he did the right thing, just like he always does. At the feast, Boomy offers him ribs or stew, and it seems like it's a test to show that Aang is who he says he is. It seems like Boomy is doubtful of Aang and may be a little angry about the fact that Aang skipped out on an entire war. Boomy's kind of a dick here, and honestly, I like it. 
Someone who knew Aang in the past only for him to vanish? Yeah, that would breed a certain degree of resentment. One thing I don't like about the original is that everyone goes, the Avatar is back, we're saved, and nobody once goes, hey, where the fuck were you? Here, they do that on more than one occasion, and I'm glad they do. So take a W, Avatar. It's a complicated W, and I'm not 100% on it, but take it anyway. Boomy leads Aang through some challenges intending to test him, as well as teach him about the realities of war, and Aang pleads with Boomy to be the fun-loving, game-loving kid he always was, to which Boomy calls him out for being immature and not caring about his responsibilities. Boomy then takes him into a ring and gives him a simple challenge, fight to the death. Katara and Sokka make it through the tunnels to find the hippies from the Cave of Two Lovers. Fucking hell, guys, how much shit are you cramming into Amashu? Is the Great Divide in here? I hope so, that episode was underrated. The hippies show them where the tunnels are, and then say that if they're going through, that they have to be aware of the tale of two lovers. Two earthbending women from different warring villages who fell in love, oh hey, it's gay now, neat, and built a maze of tunnels so that they could be together. In the original, Katara and Aang get trapped in the same tunnels and have to kiss in order to light the way out. Here, Aang's not here, and it's just Katara and Sokka having to go through. I am very uncomfortable with the energy that we've created in the studio today. As they're heading through the tunnel, Sokka demonstrates that he has a better grasp of symbolism than Katara, and the two get into an argument over who is the bigger fool. But they do eventually come to an understanding of the fact that both of them were under different burdens, and neither of them really had it worse as much as they both might like to believe otherwise in their own favor. This scene resonates with me as someone reflecting on her own life and her relationship with her siblings. All three of us were abused in different ways and to different levels of severity, but it's affected all of us just the same. My younger sibling was always the golden child of the family, and as a teenager, I often believed she was the favorite. It wasn't until a few years ago, actually, I came to the realization that the golden child is still abused, just not in a way that's immediately visible. Sokka and Katara aren't abused, they're just under a lot of pressure and have terrible lives because war, death, famine, and disease, but they both have to come to the understanding that neither of them had it worse, and arguing over who has it worse is just going to destroy their relationship. Iroh's being escorted to the pit, and is routinely accosted by one of the guards who makes it clear to him in his quirky little old senile fool persona the sheer scale of destruction and loss that Iroh's two-year siege of bossing say caused. Like with Boomy, this is more interesting than the original. In the original, you're led to sympathize with Iroh, and no situation he ends up in is so threatening that he's put in any real danger. The parallel to this moment doesn't take his siege anywhere near as seriously. I acknowledge my defeat at Ba Sing Se. After 600 days away from home, my men were tired, and I was tired. Iroh had a change of heart after his son was killed in the siege, and while it's said that he regrets many of the things he's done, he's never forced to really confront them. He ends up coming off like Yoda in the prequel trilogy. I'm just a silly little old man doing a silly little old man backflips. I am responsible for a hundred war crimes. It's understated in the original, and here it's stated outright. Iroh may lament the loss of his son, but how many parents are lamenting the loss of their sons or daughters specifically because he killed them? My brother, though. He had a soft heart. He'd gather food and water from his platoon and give them to the children. He was on watch. Then that you torched the eastern wall. By the time we put the fires out, there was nothing left of him to bury. He was 19. <laughs> I like Iroh. I always have. He's one of my favorite characters in the show. And he definitely deserved that. Then we get a flashback to Luten's funeral that shows that Zuko and Luten were close, and it's here where both Zuko and his uncle have what I think is their first real bonding moment. The scene itself is fine, but I get the feeling it wouldn't have the same impact if they didn't do this sad orchestral version of Leaves from the Vine in the background. It's okay to admit the music is what got you, it got me. I'm a weak little bitch who cries at leitmotifs. Zuko intercepts the soldiers and breaks Iroh out of his chains, and they both dispatch them together. Iroh chooses to spare the commander, who immediately attacks when his back is turned, because it wouldn't be Avatar without painting the victims of violence as more far gone than the perpetrators of it. While Boomy and Aang are fighting, Boomy is repeatedly giving Aang a lesson about how fighting is something you have to do, even when you don't want to. But during the fight, he ends up dropping boulders on the both of them, coercing Aang into a sadistic choice of saving his friend, 
or saving himself. And it's all a reflection on how in war you have to make difficult choices. Which village to save, who to give food to. Aang refuses to make that choice, but his friends show up the last second to save him from it. Aang gives a speech about the power of friendship and diversity, which given the imperialism of the main villain is appropriate. And then Boomy tells them about an impending invasion, which they learn from the mechanist, who finally did the right thing and stopped being a fucking spy. As Zuko and Iroh return to their ship, they have a flashback to when they first set out and Iroh volunteered to go with him. And it's all very sad and heartwarming and Leaves from the Vine is playing again, fucking manipulative little shits. That is a guilt song. This two-parter was a lot. It was almost an entire fucking movie on its own. It has like six concurrent storylines covering six episodes, and the acting in these is actually really fucking good, better than the first two, and covers heavier themes that the original only briefly touched upon and showed more rough edges on characters that had previously been viewed in squeaky clean, unproblematic lights, on the surface at least. The stuff they do with Boomy and Iroh is especially good and has a view of their characters that's more interesting than the original. Conversely, while in the original, Jet was a bad idea that the writers would quadruple down on in the Legend of Korra, these two episodes really want to hammer in the idea of the victims of violence becoming just as bad as the perpetrators of it, which is a trope I'm so sick of to the point that I don't care if it's done well. Additionally, making the cave of two lovers into a parable about love on a conceptual level was also a really interesting decision. I'll admit, it wasn't just a joke, I really did give the show the side eye when Katara and Sokka walked into the cave, mostly because the showrunner said they wanted to be like Game of Thrones. But the equivocacy of love is a drum I've been banging in my creative work since I stopped being an edgy little bitch and learned to love wholesome soft so I'm glad someone else is on my wavelength that love is universal, even if they did steal that from Frozen. The next episode opens with the gang being chased by Fire Nation soldiers and clowning on them before fleeing on Appa. Here, Katara actually demonstrates a new trick of bending a pillar of ice into discs, like the Earthbenders do. A theme throughout the original is unity and coming together as people, and in the latter half this is shown through bending as well, as Zuko starts using waterbending styles while firebending. Looks like they're just doing it sooner, which is neat. The power of friendship really is inherently anti-imperialist when you think about it. As they're flying, they come across a patch of forest decimated by fire and dive down to investigate, and Aang becomes distraught at the scale of damage done not just to the nations, but the natural world as well. Something else brought up late in the original when Ozai plots to use the comet's power to devastate the land and the Earth Kingdom so they can't live there anymore, again coming up sooner. Granted, environmentalism was a recurring theme, just not this aggressively. This isn't even a criticism. Some people really get huffy about environmentalist messages. I don't, because I'm not a bitch. Sokka finds a little girl who accidentally leads them to a village where everyone is wary of them, because after a Fire Nation raid, bad things started happening all over the place, and Aang instantly guesses that it's because the spirits are angry. Then we get an aside where Zuko is a snotty dick to his subordinates. While Zuko is about as pleasant as most Fire Nation commanders in the original, it was more of an exhausted intensity. Here he's like a middle school girl begging for a kick in the teeth. Like, okay, I guess I have to do everything myself. Like, always. Meanwhile, back at the Fire Nation, Azula starts her power play against Zuko by convincing Ozai to redirect resources to Zhao to assist him in capturing the Avatar. There's something about this Azula that just isn't as fun. Maybe it's because they made her this bitter, jealous schemer, sitting in the palace doing nothing. Azula wasn't in the first season very much in the original, and when she showed up in season two, she was immediately a threat, but also... She was a bitch. Azula was mean, nasty, smug, and had the world's most punchable face. She was so smug, she took time to mug for the camera during a fight. Ah, I'm a savage. Yeah. Classy, bougie, ratchet. Yeah. She was infinitely hateable in the best way possible, largely because she managed to remain in control. People remember her breakdown, but her breakdown came from losing that control. It's not satisfying to see Azula completely break down without two entire seasons of her being the most insufferable bitch on wheels imaginable. You've beaten me at my don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. This child is 14 years old. What's with this new Azula always looking like Simple Plan is playing in the back of her head? That's what I expect from a future heir. Not self-serving flattery. Whispers. I've criticized Azula in the original for not really grappling with the fact that she was just as abused as Zuko was, just not as immediately so. But the problem is that because Azula is fun, you're asking for a trade-off between a more serious story at the cost of a less enjoyable character. And the truth is, I have little faith in writers hired by Netflix, especially in 2024. Azula's just going through the same motions as the original, but without the smug and in control presence. Even in defeat, Azula always managed to look in control. The closest comparison would be, well, Alistair, honestly. But in taking away that energy and replacing it with nothing, Azula feels less like a more nuanced take on the character and, well, she feels like Azula's derivatives. Characters just as abused and just as thinly explored, but with far less presence and without the enjoyably hateable demeanor and personality. So the end result is the same as these four. What's the fucking point? If you're not going to explore the thing that's actually interesting about them, and you're also going to make them boring as sin, what was the point of doing it? Maybe this was doomed to happen. Years of 
of shitty Azula derivatives meant that new writers coming in to write Azula were going to draw on them for inspiration. Like with Zuko, fandom culture has scored itself a home goal. Aang explains the spirit world to Katara and Sokka, and so they look for a place to anchor so they can pass into it, and find a burned grove surrounded by bear statues. Perfect. Nothing's more calming than a grizzly bear's contempt as it stares down at you. When Aang passes into the spirit world, he takes Katara and Sokka with him by accident, leaving their bodies collapsed against a rock. Hey, so, like, are they empty shells or just straight-up corpses? Like, if they're gone too long, will they starve or rot? Zuko arrives at a nearby village to find that everyone now knows about the Avatar, and he's panicking because now there will be competition. Then he remembers the bounty hunter, whose name I can't remember, and sneers at her for being a lowlife. Once again, Zuko's honor being interpreted like an orc and not like the actually honorable person he's supposed to be. The gang eventually finds... Wan Shi Tong? That's pretty out there. He directs them to where the missing villagers could be found, only for the three of them to be pursued by hostile spirits. The three of them dive off the path and get separated and end up having to go through evil spirit therapy. Sokka gets confronted by the spirit of furries, who gets annoyed with his jokes. Katara is shown an illusion of her mother and actually starts getting comfortable in this fake reality, even asking asking where her father is, but then everything changes when the Fire Nation attacks and she has to relive her mother's death. Then Sokka wakes up being drowned, flashing back to some tribal ritual where he was named a leader of the Water Tribe, but then he eavesdrop on his father thinking he's a failure and collapses to the floor in tears. Honestly, this hits harder than Katara and her mother. First of all, it's a lot smaller and therefore more emotionally piercing, and the music is managing to keep its ADHD in check, but overall it couples with the grief and feeling of failure that has been following Sokka the entire series. I guess it goes to show you that small moments are a lot more effective at provoking a genuine emotion response. Aang is shown an illusion of the air temples, but isn't fooled by it and is confronted by Ko the Face Stealer, who has taken Katara and Sokka and intends to eat them. Aang flees from his den and finds an airbender's hut. Inside he finds Gyatso, but for real this time. Gyatso chose to remain in the spirit world after death in case Aang returned and needed him. After telling him about Ko, Gyatso reassures him that even if he hadn't run, he wouldn't have stopped the Fire Nation from killing the airbenders or stopped the war. He would have just been killed. It's not your fault. So... Let go. Aang leaves the spirit world in search of Avatar Roku's temple deep in the Fire Nation, and the episode ends with Gyatso giving a speech about pain. The next episode opens with a flashback between Zuko and Iroh as Zuko prepares for the war meeting that'll get him burned and banished. Then he flashes back forward as his ship is commandeered by the now Admiral Zhao. Turns out that Zuko's crew is more than willing to not rock the boat, <laughs> because they view Zuko as a spoiled tantrum-throwing brat who shows them no respect. And, well, he is but his soldiers aren't aware of why he's even out there in the first place. This is playing off the episode of The Storm, where Aang and Zuko both get caught in a storm and have their respective backstories told to the audience, with Zuko's being told through Iroh to the crew on the ship. Meanwhile, Aang arrives at the Temple of Avatar Roku and introduces himself to the Fire Sages, only for the Sages to attack. But he's saved by a single friendly Fire Sage who brings him into Roku's sanctum and holds off the other Sages while Aang makes contact with Roku. He turns out to be of a bit of a silly guy. Bit of a silly boy. Is it not customary to bow before your elder and to avert your eyes and hop on one leg? <laughs> Roku gives Aang the information about Ko he needs, and also warns him about how friends can potentially be a liability. Understandable, as Roku was murdered by his childhood best friend, Fire Lord Sozin. Leaving and taking the totem that belongs to Ko, Aang finds the Fire Sage is incapacitated, only to get lashed by June's dog. He wakes up in her custody in a cave, and she gives him a speech about being a filthy little crow, scavenging off the roadkill. Then she hands him over to Zuko, and he desperately tries to appeal to Zuko's honor to be able to save his friends. When Zuko refuses, Aang asks, Who hurt you? To which the answer is a flashback to the War Council. Zuko listens to the general's plan to use their own soldiers as cannon fodder. Worse even, he's going to use new recruits to do it. He calls out the general and an argument starts before Ozai demands an Agni Kai, and then we snap back to the present day with all the grace and subtlety of coming back from a commercial break. Zuko's wagon is surrounded by Zhao's forces and he puts them between a rock and a hot place, and they take Aang to a stronghold. Aang tries to plead for release, but he's pleading to the wrong person. My favorite part is when Aang gets pissed off and hits him with air pending, and the scribe is trying really hard not to laugh. Blow all the hot air you want, it won't change your fate. What are you doing? Don't write that down. As Zhao's army celebrates capturing the Avatar, Zuko arrives wearing the Mask of the Blue Spirit to break Aang out of prison, and the two get into a fight with several soldiers on the wall, and Aang murders a bunch of them. But their escape is stopped by Zhao, who needs Aang alive, so Zuko threatens to kill him, and Zhao has no choice but to let them go. But he does have Zuko shot by an arrow, so Aang carries him to safety. The two hide out in a hut and hash things out, with Aang explaining how important Zuko's notebook was to helping him, while Zuko confesses as to why he wants the Avatar so badly. This scene is... It's not better than the original, but I like it more, because I like characters talking to each other more than I like one character monologuing to another. I have a feeling you've been hurt. 
more than enough. Then we flash back to Zuko's duel and his horror at realizing he has to duel his own father. In the original, Zuko refused to fight. Here he actually gets up and fights. Granted, he can't hold a candle to Ozai. Zuko hesitates when he has a winning strike, and Ozai responds by searing his shoulder, and then giving his eye a third-degree burn. Back on the ship, Iroh tells the captain about how they ended up on that ship. And you know, all these flashbacks actually show a much more vile side of Ozai than the original does. Ozai in the original hurls verbal abuse at Zuko and calls him weak to a comical level, but here he keeps trying to paint his abuse like it's a positive lesson for Zuko to learn, which does explain why Zuko is so desperate to win back his love, because this kind of gaslighting is extremely insidious. It's so insidious, a lot of parents don't even realize they're doing it. We've all heard at least one person say, this is for your own good, or this is tough love, right before doing something that will scar their child for life. And that's what Ozai's doing. He's trying to paint his abuse in a positive light, in spite of the fact he scarred his child for life figuratively and literally. This is especially good because it's a very real form of parental abuse, and it's very common. It's especially common for baby boomer and early Gen X parents to be cruel to their child in the name of teaching them tough life lessons. Life lessons that will ultimately never stick, because while the real world may be cruel, it's in far more subtle and insidious ways than some tantrum-throwing man-child engaging in a big performance piece. There was a viral video a decade ago of a man finding out his daughter had been complaining about him on Facebook. The horror. And and he responded by having a full-on baby bitch meltdown on camera for the entire internet to see. When I was your age, I had moved out of the house, lived on my own, went to college while in high school, worked two jobs, was a volunteer fireman, and still went to school. Yeah, sure you were, dude. And then he ends up shooting her laptop with a gun several times. And the thing about destroying your child's belongings is the implicit threat. I broke that. I can break you. It's like when an abusive partner punches the wall, the implication being, that could have been your face. This man's behavior is simultaneously repugnant and hilarious. It's hilarious watching this proto-Karen make a fucking drama video about his own daughter, in full cowboy getup, referring to his pistol as a 45, and then using a laptop as an effigy of his own child. Sir, you are not the strict paternal figure kind of cowboy, you're the gets butt fucked in a bar kind of cowboy. Anyone who gets that tweaked by anything their child says is unquestionably a loser. If your child backsasses you and your response is to start screaming and yelling and reinforcing that this is my house and when you live under my house, congratulations, you're pathetic. You're in your 40s and you're getting tilted over something a teenager says. Ozai represents the insidious abuse present in that approach to parenting, but also the fragile ego present in every abuser. Even after being burned by him, Zuko still has the gall to disagree with him on a philosophical level. Newsflash, parents of the world, no child has ever learned any lesson by being struck. And Ozai takes it so personally, his attitude shifts from stern lecture to sneering spite, almost on a dime. That man is so easily tweaked. And this rings true for me at 31, having had to live with an exact duplicate of this man for two-thirds of my life. But unlike, say, Hunter with Belos, I can certainly see why Zuko at 13 wouldn't recognize that his father is as delicate as a six-year-old being told she can't have a pony. When Zuko refuses to accept Ozai's reasoning for sacrificing the 41st Division, he exiles him until he's found the Avatar. And, in a twist of fate, assigns the 41st Division to him as his crew. So the entire episode, his crew was accusing him of not knowing the meaning of sacrifice, all the while he had sacrificed everything for them. The 40... We are the 41st. And you're all alive because of my nephew's sacrifice. This is probably the best change. Everything about Zuko's backstory is just done better. Ozai is a more insidious abuser. Zuko actually does try at the Agni Kai, and his actions have protected people who would have otherwise been thrown into a meat grinder. Take a W, Avatar. D take two Ws. Zuko's four story is still a problem, but Damn, this is good. Whichever person was writing these scenes really understood the assignment. Aang returns to Ko and gives him back his totem, and Ko actually honors it by releasing his friends and the villager that had gone missing. A surprising moment of honor from such an evil creature. Aang returns to Gyatso to find his hut is empty and abandoned, while Iroh gives a speech about showing our true faces. This two-parter was... not as good as the previous one. Last time we did some interesting new things with old characters and established a theme of bitterness and cynicism of age versus the optimism of youth. Here, while there are interesting 
interesting bits of character work going on, they're having to navigate around a very bad interpretation of Zuko that completely misses his character by a wide margin. I like how his flashback and backstory have been changed, but the way Zuko's characterized in the present tarnishes those good moments. Even in good moments, we have to contend with the fact that this Zuko is a bitchy little prima donna who treats his subordinates like shit, and for whom his virtues exist as a plot twist instead of being demonstrated constantly. This episode draws heavily off the storm, and in that episode, he does lash out at his crew a lot, but his crew doesn't help matters by riling him up because they think he's a spoiled little prince. But multiple times it's made clear that everyone's exhausted, and that's what leads to Iroh talking to the crew about what's really going on with Zuko. While I do like that they made the 41st Division his crew in the remake, it does come with a certain amount of guilt attached. In the original, his crew is just rank-and-file Fire Nation soldiers, but they think Zuko doesn't care about rank-and-file soldiers. What they learn is that he does care for them. He was exiled specifically for caring about them. Even when he spoke out, in the original, he chastises the general for betraying loyal soldiers. This doesn't have the air of guilt around it that the 41st Division does in the remake. The crew and the viewer is given context to make their own decision about Zuko, but most importantly, Zuko isn't present for it. So when the ship gets caught in a storm and Zuko puts himself at risk to save members of the crew, the crew gets to see his actions matching Iroh's words. Zuko might be on edge, but when it's important, he shows his real virtues. Gladly, and without a moment's hesitation. He protects his crew without hesitation. He speaks out against the general without hesitation hesitation. In the remake, Zuko is shown struggling between good and evil. In the original, Zuko was a good person trying and failing to be evil. In this episode, he sees Aang's bison flying away in the storm, but chooses not to pursue because he needs to get the ship to safety. When push came to shove, he always did the right thing, with only one notable exception. Frandom Brain Rod has for years called Zuko a villain redemption, so instead of writing Zuko, the writers for the remake just wrote a villain redemption instead. Into the next episode, the lieutenant bursts in to tell Iroh and Zuko that the Imperial Guard is coming to arrest Zuko for treason. Iroh assumes correctly that Zhao figured out that he was the one who freed the Avatar, and so Iroh and the Lieutenant get him to flee. However, that was a trap set by Zhao as his ship explodes. But enough about that, Aang and the group arrives in the Northern Water Tribe, who welcome them. Aang tells them about the impending attack on the North, but they already know and have been tracking a fleet heading for them for a while. They have a feast, and Paku talks to Katara about her isolation from other watermenders, and agrees to let her train with the tribe. The next day, Paku and Aang discuss the battle plans for the North, but Aang confesses that he hasn't mastered any of the other bending styles, and so he can't spearhead an attack, so Paku writes him off completely. Meanwhile, Katara takes part in a healing lesson, and after inquiring about training and combat, is told that in the north, women don't train to fight. Aang goes to the shrine of Kuruk to gain wisdom from him, only for Yue to tell him that Kuruk wasn't very present as the Avatar, but believes there must be more to it. So he communes with Kuruk and tries to get him to take control and save the north just like Kyoshi did, but Kuruk isn't strong enough because spending his life fighting dark spirits wounded him severely, and then gives Aang a speech about walking alone. But Aang disagrees because he relies on his friends to help him, but Kuruk says cringe and kicks him out of the Skype call. Katara returns to Paku and complains about how she's not allowed to fight, to which Paku says, Female. He blames the genocide of the Southern Tribe waterbenders on the fact that they allowed women to fight. She complains to Aang, who seems to have taken Kurok's emo bitch words to heart, and agrees that she shouldn't fight, which I don't care for. In the original, when Paku refuses to train Katara, Aang quits right beside her, which makes sense. He comes from a society where women were exceptionally talented benders. That Aang doesn't stand with Katara on this, and worse, because of generic I have to go it alone garbage, is just abysmal. These people need the avatar. And I can't be the avatar with you around. Crawling in my skin. I'm all for new takes on characters, but not with their literal cliches. Take an L, Avatar. Take two L's. Zhao tries to lie to Iroh about how Zuko was killed, but Iroh places the blame on Ozai instead, and that's when Zhao reveals he's been tasked with taking the Northern Water Tribe. But Iroh argues that a frontal assault like Zhao is planning is foolhardy, but Zhao claims that he has an ace in the hole. A what now? Iroh shares this with Zuko, who is unsurprisingly alive. We've almost reached the North. Have you got a plan yet? The plan is to go in and capture the Avatar once and for all. The plan is to reclaim what's rightfully mine! So no plan. I'm working on it, Uncle. Back in the North Pole, Katara challenges Paku to a fight, but Paku refuses, and Katara water pimp slaps him in the back of the head, and he's like, square the fuck up, and the two fight in a way that is surprisingly identical to the fight in the original, like shot for shot. It doesn't convince Paku, and in the original, his mind is changed when he finds his old lover's betrothal necklace. Here, 
All of the Water Tribe warriors rush forward to express their amazement at how skilled Katara is, asking her to teach them the tricks she learned from the Earthbenders. Which is the only part of this that's better than the original, because that is the best flex of all fucking time. This old bastard just being like, women can't fight, and then all of his soldiers go, HOLY SHIT SHE'S NO GOOD AT FIGHTING! <laughs> Love that. Take a W. Katara and Sokka tell Aang to stop being an emo little bitch, and the ashes of the Fire Nation start to fall, and episode ends. As the Fire Nation ship reaches the north, the gang swoop in for a preemptive strike and start kicking names and taking ass. Katara and Aang deal with the firebenders while Sokka dismantles the ship's control deck. Then they see just how many ships are coming for the north, and they're like, I think we need a bigger strike force. Meanwhile, on Zuko's ship, Zuko prepares to leave to capture the Avatar, but before he leaves, he tells Iroh that Lu Ten would have been proud of him, and they hug. Aww. The siege begins and the women of the tribe all bull rush over Paku and join the fighting. The siege lasts well into the night and Zhao flies over the walls, ignoring Iroh's advice to wait until the full moon passes. But Zhao reveals that he has a plan to cut the waterbenders off from their waterbending entirely, to which Iroh is horrified. You're going to kill the ocean and moon spirits? Of course not. Killing the ocean spirit would deprive waterbenders around the world of their lives. Men, women, children. I'm not a monster. I'm only gonna kill the moon. The battle continues, and they actually do a Momo death fake out. That's fucking weak. They spot the Fire Nation infiltrators and overhear their plans to kill the moon spirit. Meanwhile, Zuko finds Aang and Katara and tries to capture him, but Katara holds him off while Aang meditates in the spirit world. Go easy. Enough people have been hurt already. I don't care. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, <laughs> oh damn, Aang, you sure you're not a firebender already? Zhao and Iroh find the pond where the moon and ocean spirits are swimming around, but at this point, Iroh is completely tired of this and threatens to kill Zhao if he touches that spirit. Zhao ignores him and he grabs the moon spirit, causing the set to turn a has-been hotel shade of red. Aang tries to bargain for the moon spirit by surrendering himself, but Zhao would rather eliminate waterbending from the world. You don't matter anymore. Actually, I'm not sure you ever did! But Iroh attacks him and makes him drop the fish. Aang tries to get her to safety, but Zhao stabs her anyway, killing the moon spirit and destroying the moon. Without the waterbender's power, the walls start crumbling and the ships ram at full force and let their soldiers into the city. And there's an interesting effect where without the moon, everything not illuminated by fire is more washed out than usual. Granted, this was how they did it in the original, but I mean... I don't know, it just looks cool in live action. Katara loses her waterbending in the middle of her fight with Zuko, and the rest of the tribe starts to crumble, and the non-bending warriors cover their retreat. Back at the spirit pond, Iroh starts throwing hands to kill, while Aang goes into the Avatar state and sinks into the water, giving his power to the ocean spirit so she can take vengeance on the loss of her companion. The ocean spirit starts extinguishing firebenders faster than you could say gender reveal party, while Zuko confronts Zhao himself. And in defeat, Zhao confesses that Ozai had no intention on welcoming him back, and was using him as a pawn to groom his sister. Zhao tries to strike Zuko when his back is turned, but is instead killed by Iroh. The Fire Nation continues bombarding the Ocean Spirit with artillery fire, but it's no use, because if you've played Pokemon, you know that water beats fire, except when it's really cold for some reason. In an attempt to save Aang and bring the world back into balance, Yue sacrifices herself to revive the Moon Spirit, while Katara pleads with Aang to come back. With her lover returned, the Ocean Spirit lets him go. The Northern Water Tribe mourns their dead and the destruction of their home, and Aang gets his first real taste of what the Fire Nation wants to do to the world. In the original, this is where Aang starts taking things more seriously, but he's had to confront the seriousness of the war multiple times now. It won't mean anything if we reach Season 2 and Aang is still grappling with what it means to be the Avatar over and over again. In looking over the destruction, Paku confesses to Katara that he'd forgotten how water was the element of change, and thanks Katara for reminding him of it. Paku asks Katara to stay and train a new generation of waterbenders, but Katara elects to stay with Aang and teach him waterbending. So Paku gives her some spirit water and bids her good luck. All in all, the subplot with Paku is done much better here than it is in the original. Paku doesn't really get the humbling he needs, he just gets sentimented into caving. More time is spent with it, and I'm I'm glad about that. It gives more clarity as to why they removed this from Sokka. The Southern Water Tribe is in a borderline post-apocalyptic setting right now. Things like patriarchal chauvinism don't really survive the near extinction of your people. The Southern Tribe has had to adapt to change more than the North has had, and this subplot is explicitly about that. So, good changes overall, honestly. Take a W. Iroh and Zuko flee from the north, trying to decide what he's going to do, but he's tired and can't decide, so Iroh tells him to rest. Meanwhile, Aang looks out among the destruction and blames himself for the destruction, and has to be told for the 17th time, This is war. Aang has his 50th epiphany of the season, and they head off to get something to eat. Meanwhile, Ozai learns that the Avatar is still alive, and reveals that the attack on the north was actually a distraction for Azula to capture Omashu, and open the way for Ba Sing Se. So they bamboozled the world twice now. However, he learns that Zuko was among the people at the north, but he concludes that if Zuko was strong, he'd survive. And then the episode ends on Azula's gloomy face. God, I hate how miserable they made her. Fucking smirk! 
And that's it. That's the season. I have to admit, I've seen worse. There are a lot of things in here done way better than they were in the original, but there's also a lot that just isn't. Furthermore, though I listed more W's than L's, the L's are all on things that are just much more important. Sure, it's great that emotional moments between Aang and Gyatso are more explored, and the reality of Iroh's position as a war criminal has more weight, but this comes at the expense of the characters of Zuko and literally every female character in the main cast. They say that the creators left over creative differences, and honestly, I can believe that, because Bryke are not great at writing women, but at least they suck in a way that's fun before reality comes crashing down onto you. Hell, Korra was really cool until she was getting warfed every fucking season. Katara's energy is completely sapped from the story, replaced by the fandom interpretation of her as motherly, which was brought up in the original for like one episode and then never again. Azula's character has only gotten worse, still not really exploring her psyche beyond added jealousy and stripping out the swagger that made Azula fun. She's the biggest stick in the mud, like, holy shit, how do you not understand the assignment that badly? She's not even supposed to be here, yet we keep cutting to her for no fucking reason. And I didn't bring it up, but Suki got the same treatment. In terms of personality, Suki and Katara were practically mirror images of each other. I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you this. And in the remake, just just like Katara, Suki's had all of her edges sanded off and is just a more boring character as a result. I fell on purpose to make you feel better. I got you! Admit I got you! <laughs> okay, it was a lucky shot. Let's see if you can do it again. All of the main characters are just 20 shades nicer, with the exception of Zuko, who seem to inherit everyone's edges. I think that's just the doomed nature of the fandom cycle. Fandom doesn't like it when main characters are complex and make poor ethical decisions, so they sand those edges off themselves. It's no surprise an adaptation that carries the stench of fandom does it as well. Complexity and nuance is usually reserved for side characters and villains. And that's present here. Side characters and villains have more depth added to them, especially Zhao and Ozai, who don't actually become more nuanced characters, but their evil has more layers added to it. This isn't always a bad thing, but this aversion to letting main characters be anything other than goody two-shoes means the characters we spend most of our time with are just so dull. People harp on Sokka not being sexist anymore, but even beyond that, Sokka just doesn't have the bite he used to have. This isn't really a remake problem, this is happening all over media and literature as the ao 3 of storytelling continues to erode people's idea of what makes good stories. Avatar as a franchise is probably the worst victim of the way fandom absolutely rots animation. Fandom is to good characters and storytelling what consanguineous marriage is to the gene pool. It was dead on arrival as a franchise because it had a cohesive story and end, but the problem was it ended with saving the world from an existential threat. The firebenders under Sozin's Comet were going to completely torch the Earth Kingdom and make it uninhabitable, and that was where any attempt to franchise it died, because where the fuck do you go after threatening to destroy the world? Any passing six-year-old could have told Nickelodeon at any point in time that you can't threaten the world twice and get the same impact, but ironically, you don't even have to. Avatar as a franchise is in a unique position because its lore is set up around a constantly reincarnating main character, so you don't have to keep finding excuses to drag characters around long after their character arc is over and done with. You could just pick a different point in the cycle and say, okay, it's about them now. This means you can tell any story you want, and yet they keep trying to make these big bombastic adventure stories that feel like playing D&D when your dungeon master has D.I.D. I was asked by my patrons to pitch an Avatar story, and I took advantage of the fact that the Avatar is cyclical to tell a story about a quieter time in the Avatar cycle. A story about an Avatar whose primary companion is her non-bending older sister, with the hook being that this Avatar is a skittish flighty coward who has to be largely babysat by her sister as she both learns the elements and starts to come out of her shell. I envision four seasons, one for each element, where both the Avatar and her sister were the only recurring characters, and each season spending two-thirds of itself as an episodic story of the Avatar learning the element of that season, followed by the last third being a serialized local conflict that tests both mastery of the element in question and whatever personality aspect the element is related to that she has to overcome. And people told me that sounded like a great idea because half my audience has learned the lessons I'm trying to teach, but I also know most people would turn their nose up at it because it's not building to a big overarching plot, and it's largely about two main characters loving and supporting each other, and the villains don't matter. And we're in a problem right now where lower stake stories get sneered at for being boring because the audience is constantly on an adrenaline high. Even when pitching this story, someone suggested the possibility of Neva's sister being jealous of her status as the Avatar, despite the fact I've already established her 
older sister is the more competent of the two and the caretaker of the two. I was writing Imoen, not Azula, but they think in very rigid terms, and that's always gone against my preferred writing style of centering unconditional love as the main theme. Discussions about Avatar games go the same way. Everyone wants a good Avatar game, but if you ask them what a good Avatar game looks like, they'll ask for a big, open, fully explorable world like a Ubisoft game, a self-created Avatar like a Bioware RPG, and not even a good Bioware RPG, the inbred bastard of a Bioware RPG whose legs are falling off and just coughed up a lung. The biggest possible game you could ever make. And yet, if you actually watched Avatar, you already know it would be much better served in terms of gameplay and story by something closer to Birth by Sleep. Something with a more strict direction, more specific characters, tighter gameplay. But it doesn't matter because we're still in that mire of bigger, 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 bigger. Korra was a huge victim of this. Every single story in Legend of Korra starts out as a smaller scale conflict with a very central main theme, and then halfway through it turns into a big conspiratorial anime battle, usually involving giant monsters. Season 1, we open with non-benders as a metaphor for the working class, and the main villain centered as a walking example of Anonymous, who fights from the shadows using guerrilla tactics. And then, the guerrilla terrorist group acquires some big robots and takes over the city and the army has to get involved. What? Season 2, we open with a strong theme about unity and the Water Tribe's duty to the spirit world, contrasted against the very universal values of liberty and self-direction. Where does duty end and free will begin? And then, it turns out that the Avatar Spirit is part of this 10,000 year long pitched battle against an evil Avatar Spirit to determine whether the entire world enters 10,000 years of darkness or harmony and the main villain becomes a dark Avatar and they fight a giant kaiju battle in the sea. What? Season 3, the Earth Queen is oppressive, people want to kill her. The Avatar has to make a decision between maintaining peace versus seeking justice. And then, the terrorist organization unlocks the secret of super airbending and tries to end the Avatar cycle at a cross between Dragon Ball Z and a snuff film. What? Season 4, in reuniting the Earth Kingdom, Kuvira takes a stand against the monarchy and the fact that the United Republic is squatting on stolen land, making for perhaps the best theme the entire franchise has ever had regarding the United Republic settler colonialism. And then she decides she's gonna kill everyone in a giant death robot. Every single season of Korra goes completely off the rails when they try and recreate the big climactic battle between Aang and Ozai. And when I tell people this, they argue it was because they thought every season would be the last. But they didn't have to do this anyway. There's no rule saying the end of a show has to be a big kaiju battle. You don't have to do that, but a lot of people seem to sincerely think that you do. The ending has to be as big as possible. If you think you only have one season and 13 episodes for that season, make a smaller story, jackass. This isn't fucking rocket science. The parts where the remake really shines through is when it does that. When it builds off smaller ideas the original glossed over. When it takes those quiet character moments. When it adds and amplifies small traits about a character to be more emotionally meaningful. Because that's always been the heart of Avatar. That's where people making this understood what they were working with. But most people don't remember that. What they remember was the fighting and the big epic music. You could release a five minute short about a young Avatar helping an old man walk up the mountain pass. With no dialogue, no action, and no bending. And it would be more in the spirit of Avatar than this shit. I asked people on Tumblr to describe the last Agni Kai in a single word, and the vast majority of the replies were things like drama, or awesome, or cathartic. But in reality, it's none of those things. It's a crushing, miserable punctuation mark on one of the most underappreciated tragedies the show has. I don't know how to make this clearer. Siblings aren't supposed to want to kill each other, especially not at 14 and 16. Zuko and Azula's relationship had been deliberately sabotaged and set up for failure by their father from day one, in a constant rebounding cycle of scapegoat and golden child, where each one flitted back and forth between those roles on a dime whenever it suited them, which was a long form of psychological abuse aimed specifically at pitting them against each other in the hopes of winning their parents' approval. If they hadn't been groomed from birth to hate each other, if they'd cared about each other like siblings with healthy relationships are supposed to, Ozai would have been dead a long time ago. He did this deliberately because both of them are far more powerful than him. His children are descendants of the Avatar. He knows what they're capable of. It's why he kept tearing them down, making them beg for his approval. He forced their mother from the palace to make it easier to groom them. This isn't a climactic or satisfying confrontation. It's a heartbreaking one. And the truly heartbreaking part is they don't even realize it. I'm sorry it has to end this way, brother. No, you're not. Even the music is trying its damnedest to be as melancholy and sad as it possibly can.
because the audience only hears epic music equals epic theme, that isn't the case. The number of people who recognize Azula as an abuse victim is abominably low, especially as Azula continues to be the template for every shitty girl villain thirst trap character the industry keeps pumping out, using abuse as a garnish for their characters and doing absolutely nothing to resolve it. Because Azula's story was unresolved and plagiarism isn't really known for being meditative. Just off the top of my head, I can name multiple stories of parental abuse resulting in the abused siblings trying to kill each other using Zuko and Azula as their framework, and that's just from memory alone. One of them came out six months ago and the characters literally look like copies of the two. We're still doing this shit. This wasn't like something from the 2010s. No, this is recent. This is just one of the many things about Avatar that flew over the heads of the fanbase, and it's not like the show has clean hands here. The fanbase's attitude about Azula has taken almost whole cloth from this quote. I know what you're gonna say. She's my sister and I should be trying to get along with her. No. She's crazy and she needs to go down. Azula is viewed with such little nuance because the show views her with little nuance. It isn't until the final season where anyone starts looking at Azula in a more charitable light, and by then the final battle is happening, look at the pretty colors. And given Azula's characterization in the remake, she's just going to feed into that cycle of inspirational flanderization like the world's worst Ouroboros. And Azula is just the entire franchise and its effects on the rest of pop culture, fandom, and itself in microcosm. What's done with Azula is done to less severe degrees with Katara, Aang, and Zuko himself, the uncomfortable edges that might get in the way of your cathartic wanime fun being steadily sanded off, made less messy and complicated and replaced with big climactic battles. And that's because Avatar wasn't just a show for most people, Avatar was a statement on animation, that big, action-driven, big orchestra, anime-inspired peak TV could be done for animation as well. Avatar was equal parts Studio Ghibli and Dragon Ball Z, and making something more meditative and character-driven wouldn't appeal to most of its fanbase because the fanbase doesn't want the Studio Ghibli side, they want Dragon Ball. And not even actual Dragon Ball, just that one fight that lasted 20 episodes because the business model back then was completely fucking unsustainable. This is where Avatar is always going to be at war with itself, because the character-focused storytelling and themes that made the series work is always going to be at odds with an audience that only remembers that time Aang had all the elements circling around him with angry eyes. And this is reflected in the franchise being completely unable to calm the fuck down, and that is the core of of Avatar's problems 20 years down the line. It just will not calm down. Anytime it has a good idea, it ruins it by trying to fit a big climactic bending fight into the mix, when the priority should be characters first, themes second, and action last. The fact that people are recognizing this in the remake should be the point where you start demanding quieter stories with less adrenaline. People like good character moments, but audiences are poisoned by ideas about what makes good stories that they often don't even like. They just chase them because they were told it's good. Remember what I said about how a lot of this is dogmatic. The creators of the remake said they wanted to appeal to fans of Game of Thrones, because that's just what modern live-action TV is now, putting lipstick on a soap opera and pretending it isn't a soap opera. All of this has led to a perfect storm where even though some of the people involved had some really good ideas and executed them perfectly, the demands of a trope-obsessed audience and the way the characters of this show have rotted over the last two decades meant that a remake was never going to be anything more than just a pantomime, because Avatar is from a different time where you could make a show like this and didn't have Twitter to sneer at you. I don't know how to end this video, honestly, other than saying keep this in mind before you start hyping yourself up for the next attempt to revive this desiccated corpse of a franchise. Look. Avatar was a very good show, but part of the reason it was so good was because it's over. It's ended. It's done. The story is over. And it's time to just let it be over. My name's Lily. Thanks for watching. <laughs>